Hi, I'm Will. And I'm Luke. And this is Will, Will and Luke, Luke Discuss. A vodcast. And podcast. Where we discuss content related to psychology, personal growth, self-development, and well-being. This, this episode, episode, we're discussing... Winning Body Language by Mark Bowden. Control the conversation, command attention, and convey the right message without saying a word. So and the subtitle. Um, oh yeah, check the subtitle in there as well. Um, <laughs> so I guess firstly to start off, um, th- this book's about some different ways that we can communicate with our body and the importance of body language when we're communicating with other people with the emphasis that this says more about the message we're trying to put across than the words that come out of our mouth. Mm. So the importance of um, the expressions where we hold ourselves, the attitude we have when we communicate with people and how this creates an impact on those we speak to. I suppose in particular reference to this, he talks about it's about how people feel when you're communicating to them. Like, do they feel Mm. safe? Do they feel that you're a friend to them? Are they feeling scared by you? And there's all these subtle ways in which we can open up our body language to open up to the person we're talking to or we can cause people to recoil or retract retreat mm. from us, from our body language. Um, so Mark Bowden's a body language expert. Um, I came across him first on a TED talk he did in Toronto that was 20 minutes long. And he's just like a real larger than life character. He's just, he's got an acting background and um, that's his, um, like that was his like upbringing and how he came across all of this. But he, He advises, you know, political leaders. He talks to business CEOs about how to communicate message, stuff around public speaking. He's written quite a number of books about body language. Um, Anyway, he if you ever get a chance to listen to him, I'll chuck the link of that talk in our uh, um, comment section beneath uh, beneath this talk. But he's a he's a real character, and I found his uh, his attitude quite inspiring. And I could even hear his voice when I was reading the book. So he certainly had an impression on me sure yeah i um i also watched a couple of his videos and he was like doing analysis on the uh trump and joe biden yeah uh, i saw that yeah 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 that was quite funny as well he's a funny guy i i actually i'm glad i saw his videos before reading the book because the the book's aimed at quite a business audience isn't it and it's yeah so i i help it helped me to have his manner and tone in my head when reading it because there are times where it didn't feel like it was quite as relevant to me because of the angle it was taken to this sort of corporate world but um Mm. when i could hear his tone i I felt more uh um welcome yes yeah and i think that that was a concern of mine i had maybe after suggesting the book that it was um maybe a bit too business orientated but i think certainly what we're going to talk about over the next hour is um, applicable to any daily conversation and even just bringing a bit of awareness to whether it's the, the mm. posture or the, the direction in which you talk and maybe the attention you give people when you talk. Then there's certainly things that are applicable. And I've been trying out a few this week. Oh, nice. It can, feel, it can feel a little bit unnatural, but I certainly feel my, my level of energy and attention when communicating is a lot more, uh, lot more present and active as opposed yeah. to maybe more of a, a relaxed state or a um yeah kind of a bit too laid back i I feel like when i'm talking i mean what i'm saying and i'm trying to get a message across and uh, i'm taking the other person into account when i'm speaking not just about me um just throwing words at someone that'd be fun to talk about yeah no i thought it was a little bit of a shame (laughs) that the intro and the kind of first chapter was so business orientated because as you just said like the the rest of the book is so applicable to anything really like anyone and any form of communication, but particularly if you're, um, I don't know, you have to speak in groups at work or like give any form of speeches. Um, I don't know, think at the top of my head, probably once in their life, everyone's got to do a best man speech or a, or a wedding speech or something yeah, like yeah. things like that where this could really apply to anyone. So, um, yeah, I'm glad I didn't let the, uh, the intro put me off. That's cool. And I think, um, I guess, as we go through this as well, we can uh, inject our non-business perspective and how maybe we we can apply this in our lives and how we have so yeah. far. Yeah. Um, where where do you think is an interesting place to start? Well, uh, when you started talking, I wanted 
I don't remember the exact numbers, but I wanted to chuck out that uh, percentage of what he reckons when we communicate with people, a certain amount of the message comes across through body language, a certain yeah. amount comes across through, I think it was vocal tone, and yeah. then a small amount is the actual words that come out your mouth. I think it might have been so 7%. Yeah, so it's 55% body language, 38% tone, and 7% verbal content. So 93% yeah. of what we communicate to people is nonverbal. Mm. And to like that's that sounds impressive. It's quite hard to um imagine that in reality. But I, I think a good example is like if you're not speaking congruently. So if you're talking about something that ought to be a celebration or an achievement or something exciting but maybe you're kind of slumped over, you're talking maybe quietly in a monotone because you're a bit nervous or something, people will come away thinking like the thing you were talking about wasn't exciting. They'll get the opposite yeah. message that because of the like tone and the way you were um, perhaps stirred or sat, the, the actual message they'll take away was more likely to be the opposite of the words coming out of your mouth. Yeah, and it's, I think he emphasizes that we, we mirror what other people are um, communicating to us. So, yeah, if you are communicating in that flat, um, non-open way, like crunched over, like that's how the people who are listening are going going to feel. Like, so what he says, if they don't, if the audience doesn't see the right image, they don't hear the right message. Right. Which I think stood out to me. And I guess it's made me think about the, uh, the level of... Um, maybe energy or sincerity or tension that I'm trying to communicate to someone. Because mm -hmm. I think, um, I, I don't know whether it's um, my sense of humor or just my attitude. I think maybe you're a little the same in some ways. Like sometimes it can be quite amusing to say a serious thing in a non-serious way. Yeah, yeah. Um, or, you know, kind of that sort of dry humor or that's adding a twist to it. And he's, he's basically saying like, try not to add twists to your message to make it unclear unless you are purposefully trying to be funny or dry. But I guess it's made me really try and think about like, what is the key message I'm trying to get across the key intention and attitude I'm trying to convey to someone else and making that as clear as possible to the other mm. person. Almost feeling like I can't overdo that. I, mm. I suppose I've always been a bit conscious of maybe over expressing that, that side of communication. Overexpressing what side of communication? So, like overexpressing the um, like gestures or the attitude of what I'm trying to say, oh, rather right. than like a focus maybe too much on the words. Right. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 Um, so, a massive yeah. part of this book was yeah. about your yeah, arms and hands, right? Mm. Maybe a, 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 at least three or four chapters. So, um, maybe that would be a good place for us to dive into. Okay. Well, I think um, the main concept he talks about is these different planes of the body. Mm. So there's the, the, the passion plane and then there's the truth plane that he talks mm. about, which is the area around the abdomen. And he says that's where, um, you know, where your gut is and where like, adrenaline is produced. And mm. th that's where the adrenal glands are and your stress response regulators are in this area. He calls it the navel, which I've mm. never heard of the navel before. But um, I suppose because like the navel is like just above, like the belly button area. So he's yeah. saying that area is um, as we evolve from um, ground dwelling mammals um, to standing up. Um, we previously used to be able to you know protect our bellies when we were on the ground, but as we mm. stood up, we became more open. So basically, if we're trying to if we're closed off with our arms mm. crossed or our hands aren't open, you know, suppose I'm exaggerating how high, but um, if we're not open then we're not showing other people that we're safe. Like if we can mm. expose the most vulnerable part of our body, mm. they're going to mirror, mirror that as well. Mm. So if we're mm. showing that we're safe and we're okay and we're not a threat, we're opening ourselves up to you in, mm. in a slightly vulnerable way, yeah. the other person will be more open and more receptive to you. Yeah, yeah. So kind of between your sort of hips to the bottom of your ribs, he's, mm. he's like, he calls this the truth plane where... By uh, gesturing ar around this area. Sorry, I just pulled out my headphones doing that. No, you're all good. Keep going. Then, uh, 
you're you're doing a couple of things you're you're like exposing you're drawing attention to like the most unprotected part of your body which um is telling your audience that you feel safe and when and our like threat system and level of safety is sort of contagious so when we're demonstrating that we feel safe we're demonstrating that we're not a threat and we don't i don't find you threatening and that we're all okay we're all safe here together also by keeping the palms of the hands open and exposed you're showing that you have no concealed weapons no intent to hurt so yeah. from like a an evolutionary perspective which most of this book is sort of based on yeah by gesturing just sort of around your mid around your navel around your abdomen with open hands is a sort of um display of honesty so he calls that the truth plane hmm. And the effect that that leads on to is you, you communicate in more of a an open way as well. You say, you know, there's there's a link between you know the the body and the voice are intrinsically linked. You know, they're, they're physically connected. So when you talk a bit more openly, or with your arms open, you're you're kind of ex- expressing that in a more you're not not expressing it in a closed off way. Your your words are open. What you're projecting out to the person, they're focusing down that middle channel, mm. which he calls the funnel. You know, funneling into the um, the face, funneling into that region, so people hear all of you and what you're expressing. Rather than mm. if your arms are crossed or you're talking down to the floor, mm-hmm. it's not kind of direct to them and it's not as inviting. I suppose mm-hmm. there's lots of little additions to that truth plane that make us a more an open, inviting person to talk. To. Mm, yeah yeah so one you just put in there was by like being straight on to someone rather than perhaps to the side of it or something you're showing that that that's where you want to be whereas if you're a bit more like this you're, it kind of displays that you're looking for either routes to escape or you're l- looking out for threats which again just emphasizes the threat system and that we're all potentially in a dangerous environment so by being I think, straight on, I'm demonstrating that I feel safe and I want to be here with you. Hmm. It, it's worth touching on that he, he says our natural default state is to, um, you know, go back to that primitive brain, that reptilian brain that decides whether things are good or bad. And we make quite quick decisions on that. So because of our sympathetic nervous system, when we see someone, we're deciding if they're a friend, a sexual partner, an enemy or someone that we're indifferent to. Mm. So there's different signals that someone can give to us that put us in that fight or flight response. And the open arm stance facing head on is unthreatening. It's safe. Mm. It's warm. It's inviting. It brings the other person in. He talks about like pulling someone in towards you rather than like leaning onto them. So, um, you know, if you're kind of stood leaning in someone or you're, um, you're too close to them, you're, the proximity is too close for the relationship based on how well you know each other. Mm. That can increase a level of anxiety. But I think it's really worth touching on that, that side of the primitive brain and how from both sides, the communicator and the person listening or mm-hmm. hearing the message, um, that our bodies will compensate and protect. So if someone, if we're communicating in an aggressive way, mm-hmm. someone's going to naturally recall and retract from that. Right. Or if we're if we're scared and we're trying to communicate, all this ugly, unhelpful body language is going to come out. Right. So right. what he's saying is to try and override that um, that primitive brain, that natural anxiety, that natural worry when communicating, and mm. use some of these techniques he's talking about to enhance and override it. Um, mm. I know in that TED Talk video, he talks about you know trying to get everyone to be a bit more inauthentic in their communication. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, just to op- open up our world because naturally we make snap decisions on people very, very quickly that are quite hard to reverse. Yeah, and because we, um, he had a chapter on this where we tend towards the negative. So we, you know, if we're out on the savanna and uh, a, a bush rustles next to us and we run away, <clears throat> but nine out of 10 times it's just a rabbit then you know we might have wasted that bit of energy but the 10th time that it's a lion then we've perhaps saved our life whereas the person yeah. who's like oh it's probably just a rabbit like they'll eventually get eaten so we've generally all got this um tendency towards seeing things as more threatening than they probably are just because it's better to be safe than sorry 
Yes, um, yes. So that's kind of, I think, what he's talking about utilizing yeah. overriding in human communication where nowadays, you know, if you're in an office meeting or with friends or family or whatever, then the chances are they're not going to stab you or anything. So you'll be all right by yeah. overriding your threat system there, even though he calls it slightly in- inauthentic. And I think that's what he's referring to in the sense that because we're naturally geared to think to the negative, in order to feel safe, we need the full data. So we need that congruency between like voice and body and what someone's presenting towards us or what we're communicating to people mm. is very clear and not necessarily over-exaggerated, but you know, that it's it's obvious. So it's symmetrical, it's clear, it's open, it's mm. safe. Because people need we need the full data. Mm. Yeah, everything needs to make sense because we go towards what's familiar. Mm. We go towards what um is logical, you know, what what fits into our view of the world. If we start seeing stuff that is out of whack or um unbalanced, it can yeah. feel quite unsafe. So that was that was a big um, learning curve for me is that if I'm trying to communicate something across, it, everything needs to make sense. I can't be like mm. facing side on one foot out the door yeah. saying something really important that needs to be done. I need yeah. to face the person and go, hey, um, you know, this is what needs doing. Do you think you can do it? Facing them head on rather than, yeah. Yeah, everything. Sort of incongruency. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's basically... We, we can talk about specific strategies, but it's all about making sure your body and your voice tone are congruent with the message you're literally saying. And if it's not, mm. then the chances are that people are going to think your message is something different from the words you use. And that's obviously not very helpful. Yeah, and I, I suppose in linking to like his, his business side of this book, he's like, well, yeah, you want to communicate your message clearly to your yeah. audience, like whether you're selling to people or whether you're doing a business pitch or something. But, you know, I applied this in the sense, you know, at work I have to give clear handovers. I have to share information with other people. I have to give my opinions. I have to ask favors. I have to mm. delegate tasks. You know, it's all, it's all the same thing. Like what mm-hmm. is the message I'm trying to give across and can I, can I be clearer in doing that? So there's yeah. no doubt in, um, in what I'm saying yeah. and really taking the other person into account that they're going to, I suppose in a way it links a bit to the nonviolent communication. You know, if anyone's going to do anything for you, um, I suppose you want them to to feel that it's important for you, and there's there's a need for it, and it's important to them too. So that if you're coming across congruently, they're more likely to perhaps believe you and believe the intensity yeah. of your message, and therefore be more motivated to help you out. Yeah, I think that would be the message of his book. But for me, it's more about like, uh, then they can make a clear choice yeah. as to, you know, my message is clear. My, what I'm asking for is clear. Or what I've said is clear that there's no doubt about what I'm saying or what I want. Yeah, um, that's true. Because in nonviolent communication, you can say like, I feel scared or I feel frustrated or something. But if you say that with your arms by your side in a monotone, like scared can be, you know, from a little bit anxious to like, absolutely terrified so if if you're not mm. and it's it's really hard to use words they're quite a blunt tool to try to get across the intensity of an emotion like that's all in the body language and the voice tone really isn't it um so i can see how like if you are someone who knows you're quite inhibited or filter a lot then it might make sense to you more why people aren't understanding you as much as you would like because if you're telling someone you're a bit frustrated when actually you're furious, then they're just going to hear from your kind of monotone and static stance that you're not that annoyed. You're just a bit annoyed, <laughs> but um, it, it could lead to being very frustratingly misunderstood a lot. If you're not communicating with the intensity in which you're feeling it, if you're not being congruent. If it, it does feel like another um, part of the, the toolkit, you know, I feel like I'm learning around c- communication that we've done in the, the past few casts just around, you know, it's another way of expressing myself, mm. another way of get, getting my message across and really thinking about it, like, how do I want to present the information to other people I'm talking mm. to? So there's no second guessing or I'm not even second guessing myself, but it's clear to me. And also that I'm, I'm setting up the conditions in the way I'm standing, the way I'm holding my arms, the, the rate, the volume, the tone, the flow of how I'm talking 
is in line with the message I'm trying to get across and actually becomes quite a fun thing to do. Like this last week, I've been really enjoying, um, you know, fa- facing people head on when I'm asking for something or like watching myself turn away, but then turning back and then using my arms a bit more when I'm talking. And, <laughs> and I suppose, you know, to maybe just outline a few techniques that he talks about, you know, he talks about one, you know, if you're trying to get across a, a passionate message, which he calls, um, working in the passion plane, you know, talking and raising your, raising your body language and your hands up to like the chest level where your heart is. And he gives you all these different experiments about like, say this speech with your hands at different levels. Mm. And I definitely felt how they're working. I don't know if mm. it's like twisting my brain or not, but you know, it says when you're, when you're trying to give a message with your arms by your side, it, it naturally like lowers your tone and you mm. slow down and it's not as enthusiastic. But if your hands are up here and you're really like excited about what mm. you're saying and it can inject some energy in. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, he says, you know, um, or even like standing tall and openly and like talking as if you're on an in breath um, can give you that, that confidence when you're talking. Um, mm. I mean, I've just outlined maybe two or three that I don't know if there are any other techniques that excited you. Yeah. Well, um, so we talked about the truth plane and like, it's really hard to demonstrate on this Zoom call. But it like, is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Having your um, palms exposed around your midriff is is a way to like, and, and facing forward on someone. Um, oh, we, we also should probably say about the safety thing. Like it's helpful at first for people to see your feet. So like your entire body. And then once mm. you get to a point where you're so close that your feet are no longer in their eye line, that's the point to... Um, bring in if it's appropriate bring in some touch so uh, like a handshake or something because yeah. once part of your body is out of their vision you're now a, a bit of use unknown again you're still a bit of a threat so by mm. um bringing in sort of a, a safe feeling handshake you're increasing the sense that you're safe yeah. so yeah. we've we've got this platform of um making sure the other person or the audience knows you're safe and then um making sure you're coming across congruently and on- honestly. And then from that foundation, that's where you can move up to the passion plane where your mm, hands come up mm. above your midriff into like, yeah, between your, your ribs, your heart, your lungs. And by yeah. gesticulating from that place, you're showing that this, this bit of your message is more, you're more enthused about this than you will, than your other part. So it's a way to help the audience know where the important parts of your message are. Yeah, so that that's for um, expressing things that are like important and passionate, and then mm. the truth plays when you're um, trying to communicate a bit more sincerely or a mm. bit more. Um, yeah, I suppose that there's an element of passion in there as well, but not maybe the intensity of the passion plane. Mm. And then he talks, he talks about what's it called, the ecstatic plane, which is pretty much like <laughs> if a evangelist just like ha- hailing God or like speaking in public, you know, in um. <laughs> You know, just yeah. like uh, preaching on the street or whatever. That was quite funny. Yeah, if um, you really want to get across that you're excited, then the app the hands <laughs> go over the head in yes. some way. <laughs> <That's weird. laughs> um, yeah. So that reminded me of Tony Robbins when he talked about that. <laughs> like up on stage, like <laughs> arms pumping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just get... <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it, it's, it's really interesting. I, I think it does... It's twofold, isn't it? It's the, the way you, you hold yourself, whether that's with your, your posture or your arms and facial expressions and um, that sort of thing, has an impact on how you communicate, but also how the other person hears it, um, which we've outlined. Um, mm. I wonder what your thoughts are on the two things around um, the posture of when you're talking, you know, whether like standing up straight and the concept you talked about of um, talking on an in-breath. I know before we started the pod, we were... Uh, um, debating what he meant by that, <laughs> yeah. we di- we disagreed. So <laughs> I don't know if we disagreed. I I just don't think I understood it. But um, just on the note of the posture, I think um, what we it's all still about the threat system, right? So if if we're um, ashamed or scared, we tend to crunch up and curl over, and it protects our most vulnerable areas, like our our belly, our midriff, with the bits that are still exposed and don't have ribs to protect them. So yeah. yeah, to to have your like shoulders back and to be stood up straight is is demonstrating I feel safe and therefore I feel confident and sort of you can trust me. So um, that's where the posture comes in. Yeah, with the in breath, obviously when 
we are in our threat system. Our breaths are more shallow and in the top of the chest and we maybe pant a bit more. Whereas when we're calm and relaxed and we're in that parasympathetic rest nervous system, our breaths are slower, deeper into the belly. But yeah, this point you raised on talking on the in-breath, I didn't know, I'm trying to think about it now as I talk. So literally when we speak, we kind of breathe between sentences or between bits yeah. of sentences. And I didn't know if he literally meant like communicate like after you've breathed in rather than <laughs> after speaking once you've breathed out or I don't know if you, you took it a bit more figuratively. Yeah, I guess I thought about is, you know, he was speaking about, yeah, how that, that upright posture, you know, opens up the diaphragm and allows that to push down. We're more open chest. If our arms are out, we're obviously can take in more breath. And I think just from the exercise he taught us that there is this um, this general feeling of if you stand a bit more openly and tall and you're breathing a lot calm, you know, and getting into that parasympathetic nervous system, it yeah. feels as if you're you're on an in-breath. You're not kind of, I don't know, you're not breathing out every time you talk. So that slouched is almost like pushing mm. out that air out of your system. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's how I, I, I felt it when I did it as well. And that was quite mm. a strong thing. You do feel that like there's that extra energy in you, that you're taking in more air. Um, so there's just more oxygen in your system. You just feel a bit more alert as opposed to like a slouch position, which can feel like you're breathing out. Um, mm. whether it's actually breathing in more or actually breathing out more or whatever i think to me it was more frequently. Yeah. yeah so it um i thought he might have meant not that we should breathe in or out more but where we place our words so obviously we need to breathe in and then out at some point yeah. so i don't know if he was suggesting talking with an in-breath in you rather than talking without any oxygen in your body i didn't know if that's what he meant but i think i think he would advocate not. for that for sure <laughs> i think he would advocate for that yeah but he's saying you want to get enough oxygen you want to take enough breaths in to before you talk i don't and think actually be... sorry just I'm, I'm interrupting just after i asked your question but um that would make sense in terms of singing so yeah. um yeah obviously you breathe deep into the diaphragm and you make sure you have plenty of air in you to a sustain and then you would um kind of breathe well i guess you would breathe out during the singing so maybe that's what he means that we we actually lose oxygen naturally as we speak and then we and want it, to find a nice gap to fit ourselves back up again to fuel it, the speech yeah he definitely talks about the import, importance of breath and how that um they're making sure you have enough to convey the message you want to put across mm. so you're not kind of tailing off towards the end of an important point. Mm, mm. Um, I'm interested in what you think about uh, the facial expressions um, and whether that's something you've ever thought about, like how does your face come across to other people mm. when you're talking? Is it something you looked at in your training? Is it something you think about when you're talking to other people? Um, yeah. It's something I definitely uh, think about when I'm talking to others like especially psychotherapy clients yeah where i'm seeing how um you know where their eye contact is how congruent the message is from the the expression they have and the body language they had it's like so you know how was your week yeah yeah it was good it's like well obviously it wasn't good or something about it wasn't <laughs> yeah. good right so um in the book i found it interesting he talked about Oh, what did he call it? Was it the indeterminate smile? Is that what you called it? Yeah, the indeterminate smile is is an inviting one. It's got those um like three aspects to it, isn't it? Yeah. So the Mona Lisa apparently has this smile, and because it's it, it's obviously a bit of a smile, but it's also so, so ambiguous enough that you don't quite know where it's going to go next. Like, is it going to so burst bring, into yeah that? Is it going to turn into something else? And it apparently it's so um alluring because we're able to it's it's ambiguous enough that we can project whatever we're feeling onto it and feel like it's in some way um expressing how we're feeling mm. 
That's mm. I think that's what he talked about. Yeah, and that, that it's um, that it, it's not threatening. No. Um, it, it is positive in nature, but also that yeah, it's not. Um, it's the, the mouth is clear. There's nothing like blocking it as well. But it's like you're seeing the mouth. It's relatively clear what that distinct smile looks like, but where that leads you to go mentally when you look at it mm. is kind of up to the person receiving the message. But it's, yeah. um, you know, he does, in that TED Talk video, he does a smile where he doesn't use his teeth. Oh, he yeah. says, so like, you've got to smile, but if you don't use your teeth, you look like a predator. So, <laughs> you know, like using things like not covering your mouth with your hand or not yeah. having anything in between you and the person you're communicating with. Yeah, um, yeah. No, that's that's probably a bit of a side note, but um, in terms of yeah, no, I, I'm interested in whether it's something you you actively change in the moment when you're speaking with someone. Do you feel yourself not like do you change your facial expression to? I've never thought about doing that consciously. No, I guess no, okay. the the whole reading the whole message of this book. It's um, I could kind of sum it up as well. If you want to come across honestly, which generally we do, um, unless, I don't know, I, I guess there are situations where you might want to come across as if you're lying or have something to hide, but um, then you want to be expressing ex- externally how you're feeling internally. And that, that's basically, like lots of these things basically sum up that, that he's saying, because we have a tendency towards the threat system, especially when we're public speaking. So if there's like more than four people or something, oh, yeah. then um, we're likely to go into our threat mode and then we're likely to come ac- give across all these false messages. And so he's basically giving us different ways to override that so we can just come across genuinely and congruently. And I think when I think about um, when you ask me about my facial expression, for example, I think generally with, so definitely with you know, clients and conversations, I'm, I'm usually feeling quite congruent with what I'm saying. So it, I've not really thought that I've had to manipulate my face to make sure I come a certain way. But I can see how in a more threatening situation, like um, speaking to an audience, your face might do things that you'd rather it not do. And that might be worth considering. I think for for me, it's something I'm consciously working on. I think um, eye contact is something I've I've been trying to improve for quite a while. I can sometimes kind of glaze or look away or look down, um, especially around people I'm potentially intimidated by, um, Mm. which I'd like to get on, get onto at some point Mm. um, in this cast. But um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I think in doing that, in you know, having that slight head tilt to show you're listening, that smile, and um, that slight raise of the eyebrows. Like what, when I've tried that this week, it has it's helped me be a better listener. And I've watched how other people have responded to that. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. So I suppose it's not just a fact of like putting a face on, but it's yeah. more of like a, an attitude of acceptance. What's he calls, calls it? The yes state, yeah, where you're. Yeah. You're, t- you're totally accepting of, of everything. You've got yes language. It's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to this person even if what they're saying isn't interesting me or I'm going to, um, you know, give my full attention to you in this moment regardless of who you are or what you've done. And I think if you can, it's again that interplay between, you know, maybe how you're thinking, how your facial expression is coming across and also just how you're making the other person feel. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's a good place to start and kind of gauge what's going mm. on. It's amazing to see how how other people react when you actually give full attention and allow mm. them to feel safe. You just reminded me of um, so yeah, this this yes attitude, this attitude of acceptance. Mm. Um, so another time we might get into our threat system, not in front of an audience. So if, for example, one to one would be if we're playing what Marshall Rosenberg called um, the game, who's right. So if we're trying to like, if we're having this ego battle of of who's going to win the discussion or win the argument, or I'm going to make you wrong and, you know, classic thing in um, couples, for example, then our threat system's triggered. And um, he's talks about using this attitude. So you can use your 
body language, your tone of voice, the the head tilt, whatever, to to convey that you accept what the other person's saying, but you don't actually necessarily have to agree with it. So mm. uh, he he also gave a string of words, right? So you could just like you could someone could be talking to you and you could be sort of uh, I guess disagreeing with them with everything they're saying but sort of mm. nod be like absolutely sure sure i hear that and like you're you're conveying this attitude that i accept everything you're saying not not i accept it as in i believe it too or but agree, yeah. it's or agree but i um i'm okay that you feel this way and i hear that and and it yeah. sort of puts the other person at ease right rather than if you're sort of like ooh, and you're like scrunching up and you feel uncomfortable but really the yeah. System. yeah yeah Hmm. and it's again i just want to emphasize it's not about you know faking that necessarily it, it is a an attitude and i guess that attitude is just expressed through <laughs> through your face yeah. i don't I, and i think in in doing that and then listening to people properly and like giving them that open space and acceptance you're hearing their message clearer rather than placing your predetermined ideas of what they're saying or like deciding you disagree before they've even finish their sentence that sort of thing it's actually allowing you to hear people out and allow them to feel safe so maybe when you communicate back to them they mirror the same sort of acceptance to you mm, yeah definitely as yeah, well. so I, I guess you could use it for both right with from a non-violent communication perspective um i guess he would suggest that 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 if we do feel safe and okay in ourselves then we naturally want to give and thus we naturally want to know that what's alive in the other person yes so we, do, yeah. we do genuinely we want he would suggest that things would be better for us if we were in a place where we did genuinely accept all the other person's feelings thoughts beliefs not accept in terms of believe them but accept in them in terms of like you're okay that you mm. believe this way and think this way and mm. feel this way like i i see the feelings and needs in you and I accept that that's okay. And so alternatively, perhaps from a business perspective or something, you could use this manipulatively just to your advantage to try to convey that even when inside you don't really feel that way, just to like get the other person on board to, you know, make your say or whatever it is. Like you could do it from both angles. Uh, yeah, he, d- he does pose that at the end of each um, chapter. He asks a question, you know, what's called a provocation and what are the end of the chapters is like how how far can you go with some of these techniques and you know is is too far manipulating people or is that too far and uh it's hard not to think of that angle when reading this book because i'm not a a business person i'm not business trained i suppose i've got a slightly uneducated short-minded view of what business is like that everyone's just Mm -hmm. you know everyone's just greedy and fighting for money and stuff but that's just not the case like such a broad term you know and i think he he does well to, um, I suppose, op- open that up and like talking about like more authentic ways of communicating between people who want something off each other. Mm. Um, yeah, it's certainly not an area that I, I understand very well, but um, yeah, give me a bit of insight in that. There's a thing I came across this week I'd, I'd like to know your thoughts on. So, um, Sure, yeah. I've been watching this um, workshop series on trauma and the presenter, um, I've been watching this kind of alongside me reading this book. So I've been very aware of how the presenter is communicating. Mm. And I feel like, like I found it really funny because it looks so um, incongruent. It it looks so ungenuine. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like, I feel like she's just come off the back of a um, how to communicate to a camera class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then yeah, she's yeah. just pulling out all these techniques. And, um, and it's like, here are three things we can do. Number one. And it's like, it, on the one hand, she's doing pretty much lots of the things he's suggesting. But on the other hand, I don't believe it. Um, or at least it looks comical because it doesn't look natural. That, that's probably the best way to phrase it. And so that's, that interested me because I was like, well, it, you could easily fall into that trap of trying to employ this stuff 
but yet come across like you're someone who's trying to do these techniques and i i find overcooking where the line is yeah well i I suppose um goes back to the question like what what is authentic you know Mm. like and in some ways yeah he is asking us to be inauthentic he's asking us to override those naturally Mm. those natural feelings of um you know fight or flight like Mm. our scared adrenaline responses so i mean how do you how do you overcome something and kind of express what's alive in you without totally overcooking it? You know, like Maybe even it's just I'm, practice because when he was doing yeah. it on stage in the Ted talk, it looked genuine. Right. Um, but now but, I've got this other example yeah. of someone else probably attempting it and looking like they're someone who's attempting to do these techniques and it, it looks a bit funny. So, but I can't quite put my finger on why. And well, I think um, we're just not used to it. I mean, obviously that, that example you've given obviously sounds just like, forced and mm. over, overdone but then you know when, when someone talks to you and they like stand tall and they're symmetrical and they're open and they're clear mm. it's it's almost like not intimidating that's definitely not the word i'm trying to use but it's um it's not something we're used to we're not used to like that level of like clarity and that level of like um presence towards us i think i'm quite used to maybe just my current work like a lot of conversations are kind of as you're out the door or there's mm. there's always something next happening mm. um so i wonder whether we're, we're just comfortable with people giving their full attention to us whether our attention spans these days just aren't ready for that level of communication <laughs> um i don't know yeah I'm not sure i've quite answered your question but my i guess i'm just thinking about it like why does it feel like too much if someone's yeah. just like what when someone's being congruent why does it feel like they're fucking acting well that's you know? that's what i'm suggesting <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. maybe i'm suggesting she doesn't uh and obviously this is probably harsh on this one presenter but it just happened to come up in the right week but it doesn't look congruent and that's that's why it looks funny because it looks like it's being forced and i think I, i'm guessing that he's been doing this for so long and he's got this acting training that when he's up on stage giving a TED talk, it may be there were a few nerves before, but he, he I, I kind of believe he's is calm in that moment. And I think mm. that if you are um, really anxious and then you're attempting to employ these techniques on top of that anxiety, it can possibly look comical. But now I, I'm doubting myself as well because maybe um, employing these techniques when you're anxious will help to reduce your anxiety, you know, to put your hands out there, to slow your breath, to look people in the eye, to stand up straight, to put your shoulders back. Well, that's where my mum was going. You know, there's a difference between overriding what's going on inside of you, your nerves or, um, you know, if you're trying to communicate even the one-on-one something important, you know, there's way subtle ways of overriding those nerves, get your point across. But then there's the other side of which is just, Acting, so you're not even trying to override it. You're just like yeah. fucking it off, and then trying to act like this, so that there's there's no sort of middle ground. And I think the when we talk about someone being authentic, is that there you sense that anxiety maybe is still there, but they're present they're communicating their point they're trying to say. So what what is important for them to communicate? Mm-hmm. is at the forefront of going of what's going on not the anxiety or not yeah. overacting yeah maybe yeah. i was um i was interested in the different tension states he talks about so he says mm-hmm. when we're talking we have um there's different rhythms we use in different tension states that got me think thinking about you know what tension state do i hold myself in when i'm communicating at different points in time mm-hmm. um and often it can depend on you know my my natural energy level the room i'm in whether I've had too much tea, um, <laughs> whether there's, or whether I haven't even caught myself. Like I notice that I can um, communicate with people in quite an agitated state when that's not my intention. So mm. it's got me really thinking about being aware of the different tension states that I communicate in and like being able to drop back. So the ones he says, there's like, there's no tension, relaxed, neutral, deliberate, alert, agitated entranced and then total tension Mm. i find that when i get too carried away or i've lost my like i'm just not being very mindful at work or in life i can quickly elevate to that 
tense state, which mm. I mm. can only presume is seen by the people and felt by the people. So like my resistance, my tension, my agitation, my anxiety to get my mm. message across will make the other person feel anxious, agitated, yeah, yeah. concerned, like bloody hell, what's this message you're saying rather than like yeah, yeah. learning to drop back <laughs> a bit, like picking where I want to be on the tension scale when I'm communicating. Like, oh, yeah. it's not so relaxed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can I ask for your help for something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like... <laughs> yeah. I said that to people at work the other day. I was like, yeah, yeah. I, I apologize. On Friday, I, I was um, I was feeling quite like rushed and mm. quite panicked, and I felt like I was a, uh, um, I was a bit intense when I was asking you just to do one small thing. <laughs> like, That's perhaps oh. where um, yeah. I, what well, part of um, what I really enjoy about this podcast as we do it more and more is tying in books together, and I think the series, you know, on waking up on mindfulness and acceptance and commitment therapy, ties in quite nicely to this tension aspect you're talking yes, about yes yes because that's the point where you know if you're not consciously aware you're in that threat system or you're rushing or you're in that tense state then that's just going to come across right it's it, you know mm-hmm. you might think about later like oh crap i could have uh, calmed down and thought about the level of tension i'm giving across in this moment but um to be able to do that in the moment requires conscious awareness of how you're feeling which is a mindfulness skill which um, obviously doesn't go into in this book, but it sounds like it would be very helpful in order to uh, utilize any of these skills in the moments where you need them. You first need that level of conscious awareness to be able to like, oh, okay, so I'm noticing what's going on in my body. I'm noticing that state I'm in. I, I, I have a, a moment where I can just take a breath and calm down before I communicate. It's, I, I think this is a really, really important part of this whole whole book, like this awareness thing, like how, how can you expect to employ any mm. sort of body language if you're not aware of your body or how you're holding yourself? Mm. You know, even mm. having that awareness, you know, maybe before walking into a room to go and talk to someone, even, for example, you know, you're about to speak with a, um, a client of yours, um, you know, in, in your work, mm-hmm. you know, what – what tensions am I carrying? Am I have I been like shh, like tense all morning? Are my arms crossed? Am I mm. is my face like good to go? Like am I a bit too relaxed? Have I just you know chilled a bit too much this morning? Like what am I trying to communicate across here? And what how can I best hold myself for that situation? I, I think this is probably the key part of the book for me is actually recognizing what it is I want to bring to the situation, what's mm. appropriate for the situation, what message I'm trying to get across, how do I want to be seen by other people um, and how do I not want to be seen by other people mm. and how do I want to make other people feel. Yeah. And that's all quite dependent on what's going on for me physiologically. Like yeah. am I feeling relaxed, tense, cold, hot, frustrated, angry? Yeah. I guess from that point then, then you can make a choice. It's like, oh, actually I've got to – deliver quite an intense message here. So I'm going to maybe like stand up for this and, Mm. um, you know, be a bit more direct with people or I'm about to go into a session where I'm like sharing some, some feelings or some reflections. So maybe I don't need to be so intense and Mm. (laughs) demanding or, um, where can I let go of some resistance? I feel like I'm about to go into a situation where I'm about to be challenged. Yeah. How can I have a bit more of an open attitude of open body language in order to, receive those messages in a more open constructive way yeah yeah so all of that requires um, yeah. in the moment here and now awareness to how your breath is how your body's feeling the thoughts going around your mind mm-hmm. is um did this book feel like something that was important to you something that you've um worried about before are you conscious how people see you do you think you're a good communicator um just throwing all those out there, I'm just interested to know how, how this has affected you in your life. The, probably the biggest um, personal thing I've been thinking about whilst reading it is I've got some um, teaching coming up. So I'll be communicating mm. with perhaps up to 10 people. It's still going to be on Zoom because of lockdown and that. But yeah, it had me definitely think about how I might be feeling before that. You know, where, what if I'm. Um, nervous then what how might i communicate in ways i won't want to which display threat and um 
you know, like this guy can't be trusted, things like that. And even to some degree, like it's weird. Obviously, I never usually feel anxious talking to you, but when we press record sometimes on these podcasts, like it just mm. lifts the like, oh, this it almost it's like a symbol. Oh, this is a performance now in, in some way. Well, yes. I, I don't want it to be a performance, but like there's a part of my mind that's like, okay, you're in performance mode and maybe my breath gets a little shallower, the tension rises. So it's just, um, I'm aware that that could happen probably to a larger degree if I was teaching a group of people. And um, well, he, he would say you've gone from a neutral state to like a more deliberate alert state. And you would be, um, I suppose, that's with me. You know, like we, we switch to a slightly more deliberate state because there's that record buttons on. We're trying to share a message. Mm. Um, we want to say interesting, good things and have a decent conversation. But oh. I imagine with your, um, your supervision group that you're going to be running um, with 10 people, you could be at risk of going into kind of the overly alert, slightly anxious, mm. agitated state, um, especially if you maybe felt that. Um, it wasn't going well at some point or something mm, like that. Mm. Um, I'll be interested. Um, he does talk a bit later in the book about, um, you know, conveying messages and he makes references to um, stories and the flow and providing tensions in the message. Yeah. Um, I'm curious as you're about to go and like teach people some, um, I know different concepts and lessons and things for them to learn. How do you think you can inject some kind of like setting the scene, mm. um, showing what the challenge is and then, bringing in a hero's ending, how it all ties together. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you know, he talks a lot about that different thing. I'm wondering if any of those messages have um, struck, struck you. Yeah, so let's think <clears throat> what he said. There was the, so there was a three-part drama he kind of laid out. Um, <clears throat> I forget exactly the terms he used, but it was like, you want to, you can start off on the truth plane, so you're delivering a message, and then, um, then you, once you're there, <clears throat> you can then move up to the passion plane with the most important thing you want to say. Yeah, talking w from here, yeah. Yeah, was that perhaps, um, uh, with, uh, perhaps the first bit, I think you, you maybe uh, correct me, was like, here's some facts about the situation. The second yes, part yes. was like, here's yeah. what we got to do about these facts. Or yes. like, here's the problem, was it? Like, yeah, here's, here's, yeah, here's the problem, or here's the um, the challenge that the you know mm. to use a movie reference. Here's the challenge that the hero faces, and right. the quest they have to go on to yeah. find out this and that. Yeah, and then he brought it back down to the truth plane, which was back down to the truth. Yeah, perhaps the outcome they want. I don't know. Maybe you'll remind me the or, ending, or like yeah. describing practical. I'm just trying to apply it to your scenario, like how yeah. how this uh, this challenge can be overcome or was overcome. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, perhaps th this is the fact of, um, I don't know, working with psychotherapy clients in some way. Um, this is, here's a problem with that and here's, um, um, it, or a challenge with that and here's a way we can do something about it. Here's a skill we can learn to overcome this challenge. Mm. Yeah, that's and, the bit you've got to get like mm. excited about. Like here's the these are the facts. Here's the interesting bit that we're going to tackle together mm. in this session. Um, and then perhaps here's like, yeah. here's the lovely outcome that could happen once we've applied these things. Like here's the benefits we'll reap. Um, well, you're, pu you're pulling them in, aren't, aren't you? You're like, obviously at the beginning, I'm not sure, but you might not, everyone might not know each other. I know this is over video call, but you're working with what you've got. Like not everyone's going to know each other. So setting a scene that's quite open, maybe even asking people, um, you know, to set their cameras up in a certain way or, you know, what's, how are you going to set up? Like maybe you want to show a bit more of your belly or something, or um, maybe, I don't know, not have your headphones and have your mic instead. So your, your face is clear and mm. thinking about like the setup of the meeting so that you set that scene that it's comfortable and everyone's safe. Yeah. So when it comes up to that intense side of thing, you're bringing people with you. Like mm. you're, well, there's a natural flow and rhythm to how you're talking and it's not mm. overly predictable. Cause you know, there's, classes you go to where it just feels like it's the same pace yeah yeah i'm sensing that your session or future sessions could benefit from that like raising the level of intensity when mm. you're getting to the key message the key learnings or the, no, the key challenge of what yeah. you're going to overcome like today we can learn this and this is like we've got 
all of you together in this room we can brainstorm and come together and mm. share knowledge it's a great opportunity and then at the end sincerely going what if we learn let's share let's mm. be open mm. let's mm. put it across yeah i'm excited I want you, to come more, along. you sound more enthusiastic than me yeah, i like it well, <laughs> how, um i guess finally how, how do you think you're going to set it up what what's some what's some things you think you could apply from this um specifically are you going to use your hands more are you going to um set your room up in a certain way what are you thinking um well yeah just from what we've talked about i can definitely think about what's the um what's the the key facts of the matter i want to get across what's the challenge to that and the skill we're going to learn today to overcome that and making sure that at least those two bits are, are um as you said on different kind of tension levels and and building that enthusiasm for the um skill practice we're going to do by yeah perhaps with my hands i've i can't say i've planned it yet but um uh. <laughs> make yeah no I, I like the idea of ensuring that there's a certain pace or energy that ebbs and flows relevant to the contact content of the thing we're doing yes yeah, yeah. and maybe that's where um you saw that woman on that youtube um where maybe she was over exaggerating messages that didn't feel that important maybe yeah, maybe yeah like, today you're doing three things one da, 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 <laughs> two da, it just it feels too much um right. i suppose um one thing i wanted to mention was uh he talks a bit about um you know people's territory and maslow's hierarchy of needs and supporting people to kind of feel safe in your um in in the communication i'm mm -hmm. wondering mm -hmm. how how we make people feel more um how we don't invade other people's space and we mm. can allow people to feel invited oh, yeah. into ours. Yeah. yeah so this was about the more about the, I guess the low, in a sense, the location of where you communicate. I know he talked about the example of if you go into someone else's office, you know, not kind of leaning on their door frame or putting an arm on their table or something. Um, oh, someone had their foot on my chair, my feet, their feet on my chair the other day when I walked in the office. <laughs> uh, I, Oh, I had to use all of my nonviolent communication to say something <laughs> very tactfully like, oh, you, you look like you're making yourself at home here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just had to give it a quick uh, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. That's a good one. Um, yeah, so when something psychologically we consider our territory, it's, and, and, and noticing in others when something is, you know, their territory, um, it's kind of about, not crossing boundaries and he talked about psychologically it's it's about demonstrating that you're here uh you can stand on your own two feet so you don't kind of lean on their stuff um yeah. and that you've you've got enough about you that you can support yourself so the reason you're here on their territory isn't to take from them but to give yes. and you're, you're conveying yeah. the attitude that i'm here to give to you and that kind of lowers their guard and invite allows them to invite you in so um uh, another example that just came to me, I'm sure I heard this study about um, perhaps it was on trains, you know, um, you kind of share tables on those those four seats around a table on a train. Yeah. It's like yeah. if you put something that slightly encroaches the halfway point when someone else is on the other side, there, there are like psychological studies of when people's kind of threat systems rise up to that because in our heads we have this imaginary boundary that this half is mine and that's half is yours and you yeah. should stay on yeah. your half yeah i mean that that's as real as anything i have i've ever known <laughs> <laughs> um i wonder just about being the person on the receiving end of that though mm -hmm. um just linking to something i wanted to touch touch on maybe before we wrap up was if you're feeling that someone's invading your territory or you're intimidated by someone mm -hmm. um maybe you feel that they're um for whatever reason powerful intimidating um maybe more knowledgeable whatever your uh, your trigger is to your um your space whether that's mentally mm -hmm. or physically um so what, what can we do to um 
counteract that feeling of feeling intimidated because I think that happens to me a bit sometimes when I speak to people mm. um, you know maybe higher up in the organization than me mm. or just pe- people in general who I find um, impressive to the point of kind of intimidation mm. um, I wonder what he, he would say about that oh uh, I guess um, now we kind of know the base theory around it's all around the threat system and safety that we could apply that so um, for one, I would I would think having a strong enough set of mindfulness skills that you can first just be aware in the moment that that's happening because it might be yeah. easy for you to only realise that's happened after yes. the fact. Yes. And then once you're aware of that, to um, regulate yourself, you know, take a deeper breath, um, recognise where your body posture is because of you being triggered in that threat system by someone intimidating, maybe pulling your shoulders back, taking a breath. Um, having your body square on so it, it, it's not looking like you're trying to find a way out or something so so op- open yourself up mm. is that what you're saying yeah. then hopefully they open themselves up is that what you're alluding to well from what i understood you already suggested they were quite open but perhaps in a way that was invasive or mm. so i was thinking about ways you could demonstrate that um you're not feeling threatened or, yes yes okay um, and it's kind of accept, acceptance as well like almost kind of to, to me it's about like m- making yourself open enough to the point where they can acknowledge how they're standing or communicating with you as well hmm. i find if someone's maybe talking quite loudly or quite intensely like i i might take a step back and open up and just be like i'm not i'm not here to kind of match that level like mm. making it clear that you're not communicating on that level with somebody. So kind of um, sticking to your guns of, yeah, like an, a, an over the top example of that would be like getting to a sh- getting into a shouting match with someone. Like um, I know that some people who, who want that to happen can get very annoyed if they start shouting and name calling and the other person just remains calm and says, ah, Sounds like you're quite angry about this. Like, <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a certain sense of um, perhaps standing on your own two feet, like being living with your own integrity in, in terms of the self-esteem mm. stuff we've done. Like making sure you, um, yeah, so you're you're mindful of how you feel. You're you decide how you would like to come across in that moment and what your boundaries are. So, depending on the example. We might not need to request anything of the other of the other person. They might not be kind mm. of unless they've got your their feet on your chair. They might not be literally crossing any boundaries. Yes. So it, it depends on the situation. But if you just feel like you're intimidated and you would like not to be, then just utilizing all those um, aspects of what happens when we're in our threat system. So um, mm. breathing slower, opening our body up, communicating from the truth plane, not leaving your hands by your sides, tucking yourself in, turning to the side. Um, those things all come to my mind. Mm, I, think, I think something he says as well is, you know, with, with people like that who are um, intimidating, it's sometimes about giving them a little bit of power as well. So not necessarily like conceding ground yourself, but mm. maybe giving them just a little bit more. So if someone's coming in hot and, you know, you know, he says with like big businessmen, he like, he just allows them to take the lead on the handshake. He lets them put their hand, be the upper hand on it. Or, he, you know, he, he, and he pulls it in closer so they feel like they're in charge. Mm-hmm. And then from that point, he's like, okay, I've given them what they need. I've given them a stroke to say, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, you're the big boss now. Well, let's talk like mm-hmm. humans. Mm-hmm. Like, we get it, which I it's, thought was quite amusing. Yeah. I think yeah. So, some, some people, um, I guess to agree, maybe we all do, but so, some people need that. Um, mm-hmm need to feel that they're um, maybe more in control or they're whether it's the upper hand or that they feel safer knowing that they're stronger than the other person mm. in a weird or oh, um, psychological way or something. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. And so being able to give them whatever they need to feel safe so long as it doesn't kind of compromise your integrity or yes. boundaries. So yeah, that's a good point to throw in the handshake. So he talked about, um, yeah, when you 
you give a handshake, there are a few things that are really important. So one is to make sure you go palm to palm because it feels horrible to kind of hold on. Like if someone just gives you their fingers and he says, uh, that, you know. it, it partly displays that they could still be concealing something. Um, if mm. you haven't felt mm. their palm, you don't necessarily know that their hands are empty. Um, so yeah. psychologically, we don't like that. And and again, you can literally, as you pointed out, give someone the upper hand. So you can kind of give them the bottom of your hand. Yeah. And also by um, oh. by pulling, slightly pulling them into your uh, belly area, not necessarily right up to it, but you know, a bit closer than the middle, the, the, mm. the mid part between the two of you you're you're demonstrating trust because this this stomach area this uh bit where there's no ribs where you're most vulnerable it's saying like i i trust you to have the upper hand and be near my most vulnerable area yes and that that puts the other person as you pointed out um at ease gives them a sense of safety that you're a trustworthy mm-hmm. safe person to be with yes yes thank you just answer my question great <laughs> thanks <laughs> and you um um you you pointed out a few things which are going to be in the next book so you talked about kind of giving someone a stroke which is yes transactional yes. analysis and um which is the next thing we're going to cover games people play and um yes. i think that'll tie in really nicely to what we were just talking about in terms of everything we've talked about today is the external but games people play and transactional analysis, which is the theory it comes from generally, is all about our internal states that have us express ourselves in these ways. So when you talked mm. about then that, that person that perhaps needed to feel power and in control to feel safe, they might be coming from a particular uh, ego state. And, and as you suggested, there are ways to stroke people's ego um, perhaps mm, literally mm. with a handshake or sometimes figuratively with words, which yes, helps to yes. put people at ease. So um, I was pleased to hear you mention that. Nice. So I think, um, yeah, I, I could see more and more as we've gone through this, how this is going to be really relevant next week when we talk about it. It's, um, mm. I, I, do, I do remember reading it and thinking it was like super, super interesting. You know, thinking of the different levels we talk to each other, you know, whether that's um, you know, the adult level, the parent level, the child, le- child level. And, um, the different parts of us that communicate mm. to the different parts of other people. And, mm. Um, mm. Yeah, great. Um, any, any final reflections or you, you, you feel in we've, uh, we've done this justice? I feel, like, yeah. uh, I feel like we've done a great job. There's nothing else I really wanted to say. I'm pretty happy. Let's call it a cast then. That's a cast. <laughs> <laughs> See you, mate. I'm trying to, add, <laughs> trying to add a new catchphrase. It's not working. <laughs> See you, mate. Bye. Nice one.